Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another week, another player who is the best in his country. Our guest this week is the number one player in Brazil. He is the seven-time champion of Brazil, a founder of his own chess, chess academy. He does video courses. He has a great blog, which we will be discussing some of the hot takes from his blog. Uh, he is also one of the few people who's a grandmaster and a correspondence grandmaster. He got third place in the 2012 World Correspondence Chess Championship. Um, he was a two-time world junior champion at different ages, and he is joining us right now. Thank you for joining us, Rafael Letao. Thanks, Ben, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to take part in the show. I really appreciate your joining me, and I hesitate to ask, how did I do with your name? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty hard for an English speaker, but, uh, well, my name has an accent, so everybody calls me Leitao, but actually, if you're Brazilian, you call my name Leitão, and uh, for an English spe speaker, probably the most uh, reasonable would, would be Leitão. The Leitão. closer you get, yeah, us us gringos aren't so aren't so good with the pronunciation. But I appreciate your being understanding about it. And more important, we're more importantly, we're we're well familiar with your achievements. So so thanks for yeah. thanks for joining me. I've I've uh, wanted to have you on for a long time because um. I know you've mentioned you've heard the show a couple times, so you know you probably know that I like to have guests from all over the world. One of my favorite things about chess is the the global appeal of the game and the fact that it's played in every country and there's amazing players in in every country. So, amongst your your other achievements and perspective, I'm, I'm eager to hear a little bit about what life in chess in Brazil are like. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, as you mentioned, uh, I I'm, I really uh, enjoy your show. I have. Uh, heard some episodes and uh, that's why for me it's a pleasure to take part yes uh, and so before we recorded you were just telling me where you lived for our listeners who who may not be who may not have the best brazil geography could you tell us a little bit about uh where it is you're located within that big country yeah brazil is a huge country and i live in an island in the northeast of brazil but uh well you may think an island is like a desert place with nice beaches but it's a little bit different from that because uh well we are actually in a city with about one million people which is uh well a small sized almost uh, city for brazilian standards and i'm uh, about 3000 kilometers from sao paulo who is that's the most important city in brazil so i'm really far away and that's uh well maybe this is interesting when i tell about my chess uh, st uh history because i was all, uh, all always very far away from every chess activity due to this uh, uh, greatness of brazil yeah that must have been so what was that like how how were you able and as we mentioned you were two-time world world junior champion at different ages so you were a strong player right from the beginning how how were you able to to uh to gather so many titles and become so strong in in what is not known as a chess hotbed yeah it was really hard for me at the beginning because uh well of course pre-computer uh, times and i had not uh no online chess club to play nothing but I was lucky in a sense because my father has always been a great uh, chess fan. He was uh, piqued by this fever of the Fischer's Paski match. Hmm. And so he taught me how to play chess at an early age. And he was all, uh, also very supporting and uh, uh, understanding. Like in Brazil, we have this prejudice in general with people who don't go to university. I don't know. Maybe probably it's in the whole world, but I think here it's more than, uh, for instance, in the United States, I think. So there is this prejudice that if you don't go to university, you have to have a regular job and so on. And my father, he actually always uh, supported me and uh, he wanted me to become a, a chess player, actually, from the beginning. So uh, he... Yeah, and he really liked chess, so I had a good uh, library of books here, and uh, he signed some uh, chess magazines, 
And so I was uh, working with him and uh, studying by myself and traveling to the tournaments. And basically, that's it. I had a good discipline, and this helped me at this age to compete even with uh, uh, kids that uh, were having uh, much better teaching than I had. And was your father, so it's, first of all, it's amazing to hear how many, just it never ceases to amaze me how many lives the Fisher-Spassky match touched. Um, I, I've heard it from several guests over the, the course of doing this podcast over the past couple of years, but even uh, through generations, you, you became a chess player uh, because of um, your father finding the game through, through the Fisher-Spassky match. So was, was he like a tournament player or just an enthusiast? Well, he was an amateur, like he played in uh, university championships and, uh, well, some uh, regional tournaments, uh, but so he was very, a very weak player, but a very smart person, so, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, so he could, uh, he, he did something that was uh, very important for me, that he, he gave me the good material, so... He knew when a book was a good one. Right. So right from the beginning, I was studying good books. And there is one chess book in Brazil at the time that was like a classic for beginners. And then I studied. Then he presented me with uh, Bobby Fischer book, uh, 60 Memorable Games. And then he was always giving me uh, good books, uh, uh, exercises, uh, tactical exercises books and uh, Later on, Dvoretsky's books, and uh, he was always supporting me to study. And then uh, I had a good access. And then I think that was something that made a difference at this age because I was studying uh, in the right way, I think. And I was grasping, uh, having a good understanding of uh, the classics and the fundamentals of chess at an age that most kids, I think, uh, maybe weren't... uh, uh, getting this kind of instruction or I, I don't know I, I i really understood well these things at an early age so that's why i was i i was playing really good at uh at the uh, uh tournaments of my category okay so in in your early years i mean i'm guessing just based on the fact that i saw that you were playing in world championship world youth championships uh from a pretty young age so i'm guessing you were like I mean, it's kind of hard to look back, but I'm guessing you made it to something like 1,600, 1,800 very quickly. Is that is that right? Uh, well, actually, at, at, at that time, it was a little harder, I think, to measure uh, a player's strength. You will remember, because you are more or less of my generation, that at those times, uh, the FIDI rating was like... Uh, you had to to get to 2200 i think oh right yeah in order to get to the list and if you and if you went down 2200 you got out of the list so it was really difficult to even get a fidi rating at those times so yeah uh, and, the, and they were a lot i feel like they were less accurate as well but because of the because so many competitions were just regional like or within a country so you might you might gain a whole bunch of points in whatever system you have within an individual country, but it's not uh, going to. Yeah. But then there's an element of randomness of what the FIDE rating is of the people you play when you actually play FIDE rated tournaments. Yeah, exactly. It was a, a, a strange. And uh, when I I got my first FIDE rating, I got I think I got it very high, up above twenty three hundred or something. And I was very young, but it was clearly not my strength. So I went down a little bit. And then I also remember because I was playing Peter Lico uh, at the, those tournaments. Lico was later to become one of the best players in the world, almost world champion, beating Kramnik. And then uh, uh, I remember one uh, j- junior championship I was playing, and then the FIDI rating list was published during this tournament, and I was amazed because he had a really high rating. I thought this could not be possible at that mm-hmm. age. But then he went on to I don't know, become the youngest GM in history and so on. Right. So it was different. Yeah, there was an element of, of mystery back then. Whereas now, even if, I mean, it's, it's incredible how strong kids are today, but it's in a, it's in a sense less unfathomable because you kind of know what they're doing. You, you know that the tools are out there 
that they're doing the tactics trainers, that they can watch videos 24 hours a day, chess videos and all that stuff. Whereas before, like me as a kid growing up in the US, you would see these, these, all these Soviet grandmasters that would come to the US and just win every tournament. And you'd just be like, what on earth are they doing over there? Like, you know, it's like they're from, a, it's like a, a different planet, but now everything's a lot more connected. And even, even the best players, at least we can sort of fathom how, how they got to be so good. Yeah, yeah. Today, the the tools to learn anything are much uh, higher. But this kind of re revelation that maybe you got when uh, the Soviet players went to the United States, it was more or less what happened when I first read uh, Dvoretsky's books. And it was also a kind of revelation to me, like, uh, how could one uh, think of chess in that way? And so it has also uh, helped me a lot. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, an absolute legend of the game. And yeah, his books, I mean, again, I mean, his books remain classics today. And obviously, I, I ask for book recommendations all the time, and his name comes up all the time. But I, I think he cast an even bigger shadow in the prior years when there was not such a boom in chess books. And since you bring up Dvoretsky, as you know, um, I got a question submitted from friend and uh um, multiple time guest and supporter of the podcast and U.S. Chess Digital Editor and book reviewer, et cetera, John Hartman, who uh, brought my attention to the nice, um, the nice um, memorial you wrote about Mark Dvoretsky uh, after he passed. Um, and John asks, he says, um, your memorial to Mark Dvoretsky was lovely. Can you expound on your meetings with him a bit? What was he like? What was the most important thing that you learned from him? Uh, well, uh, so when I was about, I think, 12 or 13, the first books from uh, Mark Dvoretsky were published, or at least that's, uh, that was when I got my hands on it. And uh, my father was teaching me with these books, and they made a huge impression on me. The quality of his analysis, the seriousness of his work, you know, the things that he was saying, it was like... Uh, discovering a new world, because before that, okay, I was studying good books, but uh, I, I haven't had such a revelation like when I read uh, Dvoretsky's first books. And so uh, we chess players, we have uh, something uh, interesting because we generate a relationship with someone with wh whom we may never meet, like... Uh, we are studying his games or reading the, their books. And so when you have the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one these uh, guys, it's an, a special moment. This happened to me many times in my career, uh, maybe because of the time that, or, or that we, we live, that uh, when I was young, you no know, different times. For instance, when I saw, when I was a young uh, uh, boy and I saw a grandmaster near me, it was like, when I was uh, seeing a movie star or something, it was, yeah. uh, I was like, during the tournaments, these guys from Brazil, very strong grandmasters like Milos and Sunye, who were playing uh, regularly at the time. So when I, I had a chance to meet them, I was like going to their boards and uh, trying to watch what they were doing and so, something like that. And the same happened with Dvoretsky. So he was like a friend of mine, let's say, let's put it that way, when I was a teenager because I was reading his books. And then at one moment, the, this was, I think, 2002. I was already a grandmaster, but I was a bit stuck in my chess level. I think I was about 25, 30 or 25, 40. Well, it was not bad uh, for especially the, those times, but I was like, I wasn't uh, happy with my, my play. And I decided to make a crazy trip to Moscow <laughs> wow. to study two weeks with him. So I sent him an, an email and then uh, we agreed on the terms. And then I made this crazy trip to Moscow. And uh, at those moments, at that, those times, not so well known uh, grandmaster from Denmark, Peter Nielsen, was uh, joined me at the uh, there. Well, today almost everybody knows that uh, yes. he then be became the coach or second of uh, Anand and then of uh, Magnus Carlsen. And then I made this trip. It was really nice because 
Well, Dvoretsky, he was not just a great teacher. He was a lovely person. So he, he picked me up on the airport. Uh, he uh, put me on. He, he had an, uh, an apartment near his uh, uh, apartment where we, was, uh, we were training. And then I was there. He, he never charged me any, anything for that. Peter Nielsen was there. It was uh, like a, like a three-room uh, apartment. It was quite big for us. And it was a marvelous experience. I was having a great time with Peter, who is also a fantastic guy. And then we were training, and Dvoretsky was sharing his stories. And uh, uh, he showed us all his chess passion, his chess work made during the years with all his uh, handmade cards, uh, annotations on his cards with the diagram handwritten and uh, the answers that uh, during many years, several people have given to him to uh, uh, an exercise. So this was like, uh, like almost art. That I, I, it, I was really amazed by that. And, uh, well, this made a, a great impression on me. And uh, after that, my, my play actually improved a lot. And apart from that, I gained, uh, I think, uh, an experience for that for my whole life, you know, and uh, the understanding of chess training, all his philosophy, all the things that he was saying on uh, all his books, like training your decision making all the time, making your own analysis, don't believe in what people say, training your intuition, good uh, knowledge of end games and all that. So this uh, became part of me. Uh, I started to work that way. And that's this uh, legacy that I try to bring to my students today. That's a, that's a great story. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I don't want to be too results-oriented, but, but I can't help but, but wonder, after, after this trip, whether it was a couple years down the line or immediately, did you, did you see a difference in your chess? Yes, uh, a great difference. Uh, but of course, in two weeks, you cannot make anyone a genius. But uh, right. uh, I, 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 I brought his uh, philosophy of training. I also bought with him a software. With uh, this may be a little secret, but uh, I think some people know about it already. He was like he had a software, and he was selling his uh, analysis position, his his exercises. And uh, I was desperate to to get my hands huh. on that. You know, he could charge me anything that I could possibly pay. Right. I would give to him to get my That's hands great. on this. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, I still have it today. You know, the, all these positions, and uh, I was really amazed when I when I uh, got home from this trip. I was like, for many time doing exercises from his software every day, and uh, I still use today when I want to prepare for a tournament or. Because it's, uh, well, Dvoretsky is a trainer for ambitious players. He's not a trainer for someone who is, I mean, uh, well, uh, who is below candidate master level or something. You have nothing to do with Dvoretsky yet at this level. But for a player with really high ambitions, I thought he was the best possible trainer. So uh, he had this thing that apart from his chess knowledge, he... He motivated you after you you was talking about chess with him and studying with him. You you wanted to study chess, so I can only imagine uh, the experience of those players who had the opportunity to to train with him daily for a longer period. So this would be probably fantastic. But after from after his training, I my my rating who that was about twenty five thirty at the time uh, steadily become to grow. So a few years later, I, I passed the 26 mark. I got a uh, silver medal on, my, on the third board on the 2006 Olympiad. And this was also, since we made contact, uh, I invited Dvoretsky to train the Brazilian team before this 2006 Olympiad. So he was uh, uh, giving us some exercise and showing his uh, uh, techniques for the other players also. And then I, I had a great uh, uh, play in this in this tournament, and I got the, the silver medal for third board. Wow, that's that's an amazing story. Yeah, and I know that, that his file was the stuff of legends, but 
but his file of positions. But as you as you alluded to it, to me at least, it was a secret that it was for sale in any way. Um, I, I didn't know that. It, I mean, it makes sense since you were a student of his that he would be willing to uh, to pass it along. But that, yeah, that would be uh, quite something to treasure. Yeah, I think he was not selling this to anyone. I think it's a stranger. Yeah, when you think about something that someone is selling uh, that he wants to advertise or something, but he never. I, uh, actually, if I haven't uh, uh, gone to Moscow, I probably would never know about it. But since I was there, he mentioned to me, and then, uh, well, I, I met a few other people who also had this, this software. So it's like a small treasury. Uh, and today, more than I, I don't use it so much like I should, or if I was playing more tournaments, I should be doing. But it's a treasury. It's like almost a memoir that I will have for all my life. And. And had you been to to the Soviet Union at before? Was it still the Soviet? I guess it would have been. It was already Russia. Had you been to Russia um, at that when you took that trip, or was that your first time going there? Well, actually, I've been to Yerevan in nineteen ninety six. Right, the Olympiad. It was my, yeah, it was my first Olympiad, and before that, a good question. But I, I no, I, I think I haven't. I haven't. That I I have been to I mean communist uh, countries before that like Poland uh, but uh, no Soviet Union it was only Yerevan I think before that okay yeah I'm just imagining sort of uh, in addition to the the boost that your chest got just a, a bit of culture shock to go from from Brazil to Moscow and um, in order to do a, a basically a chess boot camp um, oh but- yeah. But and I Moscow guess, is completely different from Brazil. It's yeah. like it's there is nothing, nothing yeah. to do. It's yeah. nothing to do. With Total Brazil. opposites. Yeah, I, yeah. Th- I think it, as you as you mentioned, I think it's a good thing he picked you up at the airport. I mean, yeah, exactly. I I, I, I studied in Russia, so I I can say I, I don't think anything bad would have happened to you, but you, it wouldn't have been that easy for you to find your way to where you needed to go. So um, definitely, yeah, especially be- because I was not staying in a hotel. I right. had to go. To- Far away place, <laughs> something really bad could have happened. Yeah, Who knows? but I, th- I guess once you're there and you're sort of sequestered with Peter Hein Nielsen in in an apartment, it's uh, you know, it feels a little more familiar. You're just doing chess. Yeah, and Peter Nielsen is almost two meters high, so if, <laughs> right. if necessary, you could help me if something <laughs> goes wrong. Yeah, that, that's funny. Um, and and one other follow up on this, I. I heard you mention that the 2000 well now the 96 and the 2006 olympiads and i know you were there in 2000 and 2000 yeah i mean i know you've played like six or seven times i believe um but i can't let the opportunity pass to to ask about playing with uh the the most famous brazilian chess player of all uh gm henrique mekin so he wasn't there in 2006 right uh no he was there in 2002 and actually when i uh, i told you about how I, I started to play chess, I should also mention that, of course, also the Mackin fever. We call him Mackinho here. It's a, right, like yeah. a nickname, like Ronaldinho, and it's like Mackinho. Uh, he also, uh, we had this fever during the 70s uh, uh, of, of the great Mackinho, and also my father also had this. Although I think for my father, it was the, the greatest impact was the fischer Spassky match. And, uh, yeah, uh, I have met Mekinho, uh many times during my career. And uh, it was always a special meeting with him since uh, he was like an idol for me since an early age. For Yeah, for, for our younger listeners who may not, um, who may have only heard his name in passing or may not have heard of him, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, what, what made his chess so special and why he was... Um, you know, so well known in Brazil and in the chess world uh, in his heyday. Uh, well, for a younger, the younger generation, I urge you to start uh, analyzing a few games of Mackin. At one moment, he was uh, thought as a possible world title contender. Actually, he was the number three player, uh, rated player in the world during the mid seventies. But uh, Mackin, uh, he was a child prodigy. He was Brazilian champion at the age of 13. 
and uh, I think I think he was also South American champion at the same age. That's amazing. And he was a very very strong player from a very early age. And uh, well, in Brazil, where uh, most kids dream of being a chess, uh, uh, sorry, a football player. <laughs> right. We call football. It's a soccer player in the United States. Yeah. But uh, uh, they are mostly playing uh, soccer on the streets or something like that. Mackin was having fun uh, trying to refute the analysis of Ruben, Ruben's fine uh, Endgames book when he was at the same age. Wow. So he was like a chess fanatic from a very early age. Uh, and I admire that because uh, chess has been part of my life uh, forever since I was uh, six years old when I learned chess has always been part of my life so I really I greatly admire people who gave uh, their whole heart for chess his, their, their lives and so on and you can see that Mackin is one of them uh, there is no meaning for his life without chess so I greatly admire this of course he had a, he has a unique personality uh, it's not very easy to deal with him for most uh, organizers, ex especially. But uh, he he uh, was a uh, he still is a, a good chess player, and of course he was a great chess player at those times. And when he was on the, the more or less the peak of his career, uh, we must say he won two international tournaments, and so he played uh, twice in the uh, candidate cycle. And uh, the, once he was eliminated by Lev Polugaevsky, he lost one game and they drew all the other games. And then uh, the, his last appearance in the candidate's term, uh, candidate cycle, he lost to Korshnoi, who went, who went on to challenge Karpov and almost beat Karpov uh, uh, later on. And then he lost this match to Korshnoi 3-1. Uh, he lost three, lost three games and won one. So he was a really good player. He was one among the best. But then he had a, a, a disease when he was on the peak of his career, and he was still very young at the time. And then he left chess, and uh, he didn't play for a long, long time. And then he only uh, came back to chess when he was already at an, a an age and, a, and at a time that he could not be the same player he was one day. Yeah, hap happens to the best of us, but... Uh, a legend nonetheless and and yeah. a uh, a friend and listener of the podcast uh not not going to say his name but he knows who he is d did attempt to get uh grandmaster mecking uh as a guest on this show but but no luck so <laughs> before before yeah. you guys all send emails <laughs> asking me to get him uh we tried um and if, and gm mecking if you catch wind of this you're always welcome but uh but yeah i don't know if it'll happen um <laughs> okay well thank you for that perspective um you know as i as i was as i've said i mean it's just there's so many chess personalities in so many corners of the world that sometimes people don't get the proper shine i mean obviously the the stronger players listening to this know well who he is but yeah. uh just just in case anyone didn't um it's good good to get some more detail um and and as you say it's nice to hear how like when when one a player of that caliber devotes their life to chess. It has a sort of a cascade effect where someone like you then devotes your life to chess and on it goes exactly. generation to generation. Um, so Raphael on a different topic, um, when I alerted the supporters of the podcast that you were coming on, one of the potential topics that I mentioned was I had, um, I had a while ago read your post about uh, your top chess players of all time. And then I had also read the, a little quote from chess 24 that came out during the FIDE world cup where Magnus Carlsen, while he was doing one of um, his broadcasts, was asked his opinion about the greatest of all time. And Magnus had the quote, which is if the question is whether I think Kasparov or Fisher was greater, I think no serious chess player or historian thinks that Fisher is greater in a historical context than Kasparov. Um, so that made some headlines. Um, and of course, you're on the record on being on the other side of this argument. So when I submitted this, when I shared this with uh, the supporters of the podcast, it kind of felt like it stirred up a hornet's nest. We got three different questions about it. So um, I'm sorry to go on for so long, but I'd just like to read you, you these three questions. Um, or I guess, yeah, three questions. Um, and then you, you can have the floor and tell us, uh, make the argument for why 
Fisher is the greatest of all time. So are uh, you ready for the questions? Yeah. Okay. In there. So here we go. Question number one is from Suratim uh, Sanyo. I hope I'm sure I didn't say that right, but I hope I said it right. Um, and Suratim says, is Magnus Carlsen facing a much stronger field than Kasparov or Fisher? And who are your top five players all time at this moment? So actually, we could take that one first before we get to the next two. Okay, this is a... Well, first of all, this is a very controversial topic. This, uh, by far in my blog, is the uh, article with most comments, both in English and in Portuguese. I hope I can translate everything that I have already in Portuguese for English, so right. the English uh, readers will have a, a, a lot of other controversial topics. But uh, I think when you make this exercise of uh, trying to say the best uh, athletes of, uh, of, uh, of the, in the history, it's always very subjective and maybe it's impossible to be 100% objective on this field. So, but addressing uh, what this uh, reader asked you, the first thing I want to clarify is that I see no point in trying to bring someone who played uh, chess at uh, uh, 40 years before, 50 years before, to the present. It's like uh, this can happen in other sports as well. Right. Uh, if, you, if you bring Jesse Owens to run the 100 meters today, I'm not sure about his time, but probably I'm almost sure he wouldn't even qualify to uh, the final of the 100 meters. So right. there is no point in doing this exercise. Every sport uh, evolves, but this is not the question. The question is, uh, well, actually, there are a lot of other questions that we could bring to the subject, whether uh, how, how much uh, this, uh, uh, this player, this athlete, have generated to the game, how better he was from the rest of the fields. I mean, there are a lot of things that we can address. Okay, whether... Fischer would be uh, playing against uh, the best uh, chess players in the world right now? Of course, the answer is uh, obviously not. He would be losing to most of them. He would not uh, give any kind of fight to Magnus Kaus in a match. Absolutely no chance, nor, neither to Caruana or Ding Liren for that matter. But uh, the, the, the reasons why I have uh, picked Fisher are other reasons. And uh, maybe the next questions, maybe they will ask something that will give me uh, the chance to, exp to explain better why. But I just wanted to say that you cannot bring someone uh, from 50, year 50 years back to the present. This exercise has no meaning. And also I wanted to say that... Uh, it's like a it's like a fun exercise, but uh, I, I I don't intend to prove to anyone that Fisher <laughs> right. was better than Kasparov or something. It's more like a nice topic, and I think the, the something nice about this topic is that it brings the opportunity for people to discuss the heritage of those great players and also the classics. Because I think for every every good chess player must have a, a complete grasp of the classics. So this gives us the opportunity to think uh, about, uh, well, whether Fischer was better than Kasparov or Capablanca was better than Alekin or something like that. And also answering what he asked uh, later, the five, my five best players, I would still, uh, I cannot, I, 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 I must now make some... Uh, Maybe some upgrade. I cannot decide upon Fischer, Kasparov, and Magnus Carlsen. I think these are obviously the three best players in chess history, in my opinion. Uh, but, okay, Magnus Carlsen is still playing today, so we don't know the uh, what is going to be his legacy. But let's say I will still put Fischer first, Kasparov second. Uh, Magnus Carlsen, I think, is number three in my list. And now it's really tough because... Uh, I wanted to bring Karpov to this list, but I think I will, I will still pick up Alekin at number four and Capablanca at number five. Okay, holding true to what you had on your blog. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You're not going to penalize Magnus Carlsen, even though he said that no serious player can have Fisher number one. You're not going to move him down for that. 
Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, Magnus is known for picking on all yeah. those things. Maybe I, yeah. I think Caruana once said that his favorite player was Bobby Fischer or something like that. Maybe he was picking on him, I know. Right, yeah, like it's, or if Geary's involved somehow, I'm sure he's picking on Geary. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, as you say, uh, we can't take these things too seriously. And what you bring up about uh, cross generations is uh, is a point highlighted. Todd Kennedy, another uh, supporter of the podcast. Thank you for the support, Todd. He wrote in and said basically the same thing. I'll, I'll read what, what Todd wrote. Um, he said, I, I wonder about what criteria you used. Do you think if you put Fisher in his prime and had him time travel? So it's already like the premise is already, you know, it's it's already silly to argue about, which is what Todd is saying. So he's saying, so he's sitting across from Carlson. Do you think Fisher would win? Only if Fisher had time to prepare, so on and so forth. Uh, or do you think he's the greatest? Then uh, this is what I think is important. Do you think he's the greatest to be the player who dominated his opponents the most? Um, so, well, and, and that's where you could make the argument, even though it was a short period of domination. Exactly. This is a good argument. Well, no, it's like also a, a player that, uh, has this kind of legend aura, like, uh, Paul Murphy. It was similar to Bobby Fischer. He came to Europe and then he beat everyone and he was clearly the best player in the world. Nobody could play with him. Then he stopped playing, but okay. So his legend was born. Uh, with Bobby Fischer, uh, it was actually, as I said, it's hard to be objective. As I told you, I started playing chess because my father was a Fischer fan. And then he was, uh, analyzing the Fischer's past games. So it's impossible to be objective at this matter. Fischer has always been part of my chess life. Like the first, one of the first books I studied was, was his book. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you analyze Fisher's legacy, you see that he we can make an argument for him being the best. He was grandmaster at age fifteen, at an age that nobody uh, came even close to doing that. Uh, he, his record was beaten by Judith Poger several uh, years later. I mean, it's yeah, he was time. really. A, a long time he kept this record. He was playing against the best players in the world. He was more or less self-taught, or at least in comparison with uh, the people he was trying to beat, he was self-taught. Well, uh, uh, the Soviet players from uh, had uh, all this support from the state, and they were, since the appearance of Bobby Fischer, they were thinking, how can we beat this guy? So there is this book, uh, Russian, uh, I think the Russians uh, against Fischer or something like that, and uh, the, where the KGB files were uh, made public about the Fischer problem and the meetings they had, uh, so how they could beat this young boy that, was, that is appearing and so on. And of course, everybody knows that uh, the tournaments they played they were agreeing at draws to, well, it was impossible for Fisher to fight against them. That's why he made this uh, request uh, on Fiji to change the rules and so on. And uh, what Fisher did at uh, this final part of, this, of his career, because I don't consider the match he played with Spassky in the 90s as Bobby right. Fisher anymore, okay? So for me... It's over in 1972. But what he did has no parallel in the history of chess. Which player uh, in the history of chess can beat Petrosian in four straight games? You tell me one, and then I can uh, think, okay, maybe I'm exaggerating about Bobby Fischer. But right. you, te you tell me one. Kasparov, no. Uh, Carlsen, I don't think so. I cannot, I cannot think about one player who could beat Petrosian in four straight games. And what he did, he was beating everyone, everybody right in square. So uh, it's a legend. What he did, it's a legend. Yeah. But as many readers or listeners will say, he did this for a, a short period of, of time. And he was not clearly the best players in the 60s. I think at least uh, do, uh, until the mid-60s, the best player was Spassky, in my opinion. But uh, so it was really short period when he was really the clear, clear the best player. But he did something special, and his legacy is felt uh, until today in uh, many countries. In South America, especially, 
many generations of players are, uh, uh, are playing chess because of him. I think there is no parallel to the history of chess. No player brought so many, uh, uh, so many generations of chess players were born due to due to Bobby uh, to Bobby Fischer. You know? he is the greatest in this field, I think. And uh, I mean, for me, this is special. He has this legacy, and uh, he was uh, like 20 years ahead of his time. Also, so, but as you say, it's a small period of time. If we, we make some statistical analysis, objective, cold-blooded, of course, we cannot compare him to uh, Kasparov, who dominated the chess world in uh, for a much longer period. And also, if you say, okay, Bobby Fischer was, I don't know the exact number, but about 150 rating points above Boris Spassky, the second rate, best rated player at his time. Nobody also came close to this. Uh, but you can argue that uh, this is not a fair argument uh, because uh, Kasparov and Karpov are uh, two players uh, that always are in the top 10 list. You always have Kasparov and Karpov. So the two genius in the same generation, like uh, Nadal and Federer, like right, Cristiano yeah. Ronaldo and Messi. So this is also not a nice argument. But uh, what can I say? Everybody will have his point of view in this matter. If you ask to me, for instance, like here in Brazil, everybody's crazy about uh, soccer. So if you ask me, what is the best soccer player ever, or at least the best soccer player that I have ever watched? So you expect me to say... Uh, okay, Pe not Pelé because I never saw him playing. You expect me to say Messi or uh, Cristiano Ronaldo probably, but no. For me, it was Ronaldinho Gaúcho. And this, if you say, but he he never uh, had the same consistency of these two players. But for two years, he was like something different from this world. These right. two years, so it was something that I if you, if there was a, a soccer game. Ronaldinho was playing, I would stop everything I was doing just to see this guy play. So it's a subjective matter. So for me, Fisher is probably, uh, will, will probably be always the number one. Okay, an excellent impassioned defense. Yeah, and it's like you say, since it can't be settled scientifically, um, you've got to, it's all about the feeling it evokes in the individual. And you pretty much tackled the third. The third question was from Vyacheslav Nemec. And he just, as you mentioned, he, he pointed out just that Kasparov's reign was for much longer. Uh, so I just wanted to give him a shout. But I, th I think um, you, you've addressed it, um, which is basically it's, you concede that it's not it's not um, it's not an argument that can be won one way or the other. So it's, it's just a fun thing to talk about. Uh, yeah, man. just 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 one more thing about this top ten list that I think it's interesting is that one thing that we we, we could discuss for ages is who is better uh, in, a, in a top ten list in a, the best players list, Alekin or Capablanca. So yeah. also two genius of the same generation. So it's very hard because Capablanca is said to be the most talented, but Alekin was a hard worker, and I consider this a talent also. It's impossible impossible to settle this. So I just want to make one correction, uh, one upgrade from my list. For anyone who reads that, I would change one thing in this list. And I was correctly criticized, I think, for not bringing uh, Tao's name to this top 10 list. And uh, people got very angry when they course, read yeah. this list. And they didn't see Tao's name there. And I think they have... Uh, uh, well, fair reason. And uh, I would change this list. I would put uh, Tao in and put Kramnik out. Unfortunately, not that I don't like him, but I would uh, favor Tao over him. Okay. Apologies to GM Kramnik. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, it's a tough choice for sure. Yeah. I can't really go wrong. All right. Well, I, like I said, I, I love the enthusiasm and it's, it's fun to talk about. It's like one of the only, one of the rare areas where like, you know, they have all, I'm sure they have them in Brazil too, but all these uh, sports shows where people like to have different takes, you know, they just like to argue basically about like who's better, um, you know, who would win across generations and stuff like that. And this is exactly. uh, considering all the hours that I've spent 
talking chess here on this podcast. It's amazing we haven't spent more time on that exact debate, um, but it's fun to touch on it. But uh, switching gears, um, we had a question related to your opening repertoire. You've got um, pretty fun repertoire. I saw that you'd done a video on uh, the Night Orf, and you're also a Sicilian Timonov player. And FM Andre Tarakov actually has two questions for you, but we'll start with the one relating to openings. So Andre writes in and asks... Uh, I am a lifelong Sicilian Taimanov player. About 10 years ago, you were one of the main proponents of this variation for black. However, it seems that you always preferred a rarer line 5A6 instead of the more common 5 queen C7, and later you switched to the Nidorf as your primary weapon. I'm curious why you decided to move away from the Taimanov, and what is your view on the comparative merits and disadvantages of these Sicilian lines that you play? Uh, well, uh, I had always have this passion for the Sicilian defense. It was uh, my favorite defense uh, since I was a young kid. And I have always played the Nidor. And this is the Sicilian that I consider the best, at least for my style, for my taste. But, of course, uh, it's hard to play the Nidor full-time if you don't study a lot of openings. It can be very dangerous uh, if someone catches you unprepared. Of course, if you have the uh, repertoire of uh, Ashela Graf, then you can do it. But right. otherwise, it's not very easy. So at, so at one point, I decided that I wanted to be more flexible. And then uh, I became a sort of a specialist in this time and off variation without Queen C7. And I am probably one of the players above 2,600 that have the most number of games in this line. Although also Movsesian used to play it a lot. Oh, sorry, Rublevsky is much bigger specialist than me. Uh, and also one Russian guy called Grachov. He is also was also playing this. And I, 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 I uh, to be flexible, I played this line with. Uh, without queen c7 and sometimes Taimanov with queen c7 uh, because there are some differences and then there's some small details of move orders and uh, if the the guy tries to play the English attack then it's better not to have your queen on c7 then I had some ideas on these lines and basically that's it so it's a nice uh, these lines uh, Sicilian Taimanov uh, I think it's a nice variation, but the theory has evolved a lot on these later years. Although I must say, uh, I am not a big openings specialist anymore. I don't study so many openings. Uh, and like in 2000, 2017, I was invited to play a tournament in China to play against very strong players like Yu Yangi, wow. uh, Motilev, and so on. And I was playing the Sicilian, and uh, well, I lost to you, Yangi, but not due to the opening, and so I could still defend myself with this variation. So I think a Taimanov is a good line. Of course, you have to know its details, but it's a good alternative if you don't want to go to the mess that uh, happens in the night or sometimes. Yeah, so I saw, um, as far as I saw, uh, when I looked, there might have been something that I just looked on chessgames.com. My database takes a while to fire up. And it looked like one of your most recent tournaments was the 2018 Olympiad. And you went with the Taimanov there. Oh, uh, yeah. And I played uh, uh, I, the only game that I lost uh, was in the Taimanov. But OK, I, I was caught off guard in the opening. But then I got a better position anyway, because I had already a good feeling with the opening and then I made a draw with Black against Kulauts, who uh, a few months later surprisingly won the Aeroflot Open. Right, so yeah. he's a very dangerous player, and I had no particular problems in the opening. So, well, even if if uh, even I could play without so many analyses and uh, with a horrible memory that huh. I have, then everyone can play it and oh, so don't need to worry. I've got to pounce on that and ask a question because we've had different people talk about the importance of memory. Like when, uh, when I was lucky enough to have Evgeny Bureyev, um, uh, join the show, he was saying that he had worked with, with Karpov and it was kind of a running joke amongst the people who'd worked with Karpov, um, 
on one of his preparation teams that he didn't have the best of memories. And I found that surprising that a player of his caliber and even even a player of your caliber, um, you know, obviously you're an incredible player, but you're you're not Anatoly Karpov. But you, you would say that your memory is not great. Yeah, my memory is awful. And has it, it has always, always has been. it always always been? Wow. Yeah, it has always been awful. My memory, although of course I'm not saying that uh, like after the game, I'm, I'm not saying these uh, things like. Uh, of course, I can remember my games after the tournament. I can remember them uh, for a month later, uh, probably some uh, special games. Uh, if you show me some uh, classical game, I can recognize which game it was immediately, even though I cannot reproduce it from uh, from the first moves. But I can say this game is Capablanca Lekin. This game is... Okay, it's not that uh, I have a disease or something like this. But I cannot remember my analysis for a long period. I, I mean, I, I, if I analyze some variation, it's uh, from one tournament to the other. I have already forgotten everything. So okay, and it's and it's always been that way. Yeah, but uh, uh, what saves me, in a sense, is that I, I have good feeling for patterns and uh, the general ideas, and then I can I can recognize themes uh, fast. And uh, I, I kind of learned to live with that, that my memory is not good. So I try to, if I play some very sharp variation, I try to uh, memorize it a little more probably than uh, people with better memories. But I mean, of course, it's a good thing for you to have a good memory in any uh, field, of course. Who, who doesn't want to have a good memory? But uh, I think one can be a good chess player even without good memory. So uh, you mentioned Karpov. I don't doubt about it because I think he 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 was much. When I studied with him, I had the luck to study one afternoon with him. Oh wow! And he was much more keen to understanding the ideas. Of course, he was already kind of old when we did that, but he was more thinking of ideas and so on. I think people say a lot about Reshevsky also, who he didn't have a good memory. And I mean, it's possible you can uh, you can become a good chess player with, uh, with even without a good memory. I think. Okay, uh, there's probably more than one listener r- relieved to hear that. <laughs> um, yeah. And so you mentioned studying with with Karpov, um, and obviously you you told the great Dvoretsky story earlier. Who, what uh, what other memorable legends have you met in all your years uh, traveling the world, playing and uh, teaching and studying chess? Uh, well, I have uh, I, I had good meetings with Karpov. We uh, talked a lot many times, and uh, we trained together this time. I, we played some blitz games. Also, wow. it was really nice. Well, I met Anand, which is fantastic, uh, apart from being a fantastic player, fantastic guy, uh, wonderful. Uh, and I have a curious joke. I Maybe I shouldn't have uh, be, be, talk, be talking this, but okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, uh, there was one Blitz tournament here in Brazil, and uh, somehow the organizer managed to have Kasparov in this blitz tournament for some he ha, he was doing some other activities here in brazil and he was like a guest in this tournament and he went to see uh, the blitz uh, games and i was in the final match against another brazilian grandmaster which i was I, i'm not going to name the guy <laughs> because it's not a nice story and something really incredible i think that the, the the time in my life that I was most, uh, most I don't know how to say that in English, but I was most shame of myself, uh, uh, biggest shame of my life, because we were playing this game, and the guy, Kasparov, was right beside me. He was looking at our game. Maybe because of this, probably I was a little nervous. Right, yeah. And the guy, come on, Kasparov looking at my blitz game. Come on. And then uh, the guy checks me at one moment in this game. And I, instead of moving my king, I check him back. So I give him a counter check, which obviously is not allowed <laughs> by the laws of chess. And the guy, he simply moves his king. He huh. also didn't notice 
And then I moved my king, and then I won this game. And the game finished. And then uh, 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 I, I, we didn't realize what was happening. And then I was looking at Kasparov, and he was shaking his head in disbelief. <laughs> So imagine these faces that Kasparov yeah, normally pull off. But very imagine histrionic, he was like, yeah. Uh, he was like, I can't believe this is chess in Brazil. This is different from uh, Russia. I mean, so it was, <laughs> but it was okay. It's, uh, did, did he it's make a any? Story. Did he make any comments, or did he just just gesticulate and? Uh, no, it was fun. I mean, he good. was now he was not disrespectful. He was that's not good. saying, "Come on, you're a pastor." He was saying, "You know." No, I have a similar story about this. Once I was playing Psachis or something like that, and I, I didn't notice, notice that he had moved his king, and then the guy castled, and I didn't notice. The game went on. So, but like this, I have never seen in my life. He said something like huh. this. But okay, it was a fun uh, story. It's funny. Yeah, it's a great story. Um, and who's the? Who do you think is the strongest player you've ever played? Uh. I think probably Anand. Yeah, I think. it's hard, hard yeah. to top that. Yeah. Yeah, I played Karpov also, but he was not uh, the same Karpov anymore, of course. But I played Anand at the more or less the height of his powers. This was 20, 2004. Uh, so he was like a monster. He was playing this rapid tournament in Brazil, and he was like unbelievable what he was doing. And speaking of good memories, Anand has fantastic memory. Like uh, I remember my friend, Grandmaster Giovanni Vasco from from Brazil. He was trying to surprise Anand in an opening, and so he chose a rare line to surprise him. And Anand knew everything, you know, and he even uh, had already a, 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 some small improvement over the theory. So it was wow. incredible. It was uh, way. Uh, had everything I have seen, so he was uh, at least personally uh, the the greatest player I have played. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. So so many legendary stories about him. Um, yeah. Okay, other question from Andre Tarakov, and this is the last question from a Patreon supporter. Um, so. Andre also says you're one of the few players who holds a GM title in both over the board and correspondence chess. Uh, you finished third in the 26th world championship, which is very impressive to me as a correspondence player. However, it seems that you haven't played another correspondence game since I'm curious why you stopped playing correspondence. And on a more general note, do you think that correspondence chess has a future in the world of stockfish and alpha zero? Uh, well, actually this, uh, result I I had in my correspondence tournaments really surprised me because I was not expecting. I never started playing these tournaments uh, thinking I could ever become a grandmaster. Actually, I was quite surprised when the tournament finished and I learned that I had uh, I got the grandmaster title. And I started playing correspondence chess more in order to motivate myself to make. Uh, uh, opening analysis and improve my analytical ability and also yeah mostly is th this so that was the reason I started playing so I was playing for a short period and I got some decent results because uh, some players that I was facing it was clear they only played uh, the first move from the computer and uh, sometimes you could find a, a way to exploit that, at least at those times. So, for instance, positions where uh, there was uh, an attack on the king at, uh, at those times, at least, uh, the engines uh, didn't evaluate correctly this position, so they thought the position was good. And then when the guy uh, felt the danger, it was already over. So I won a few games like that. And uh, when I was analyzing my games, I had this ritual that I, I never turned the computer on before I had decided which move I would play. If it was, of course, in correspondence chess, is, it is allowed to use computer. Uh, but I never checked the, any analysis with my computers before I have decided my, my move so oh, I could make good. this comparison. And I was training that. And actually, I think this improved a lot my game at that time because I was making a lot of analysis 
It improved my opening repertoire. So especially the Sicilian defense, some Scheveningen variations that were quite popular at the, those times. I was tested in a lot of correspondence games and I managed to find new ideas and uh, I, I, I became kind of a specialist on those positions. And so, well, that's why I was, I was playing at those times. But, and also I'm a competitive uh, guy as any chess player. So when I started playing... I didn't want to lose, and then uh, and I, I I also enjoy a lot this uh, when I have some uh, problem solving tasks, so I can spend, for instance, the whole afternoon trying to solve a single problem. So I could be analyzing one position from my games for a long period of time, and so this was nice. But I was a little upset when uh, with these things that the, uh, many many guys playing. Uh, immediately the first move from the computer and then the computer is getting stronger and then uh, I was I, 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 I lost the passion to play in correspondence chess so I didn't see any points in doing that anymore so I don't think correspondence chess has much future in the in the world we live today because sooner or later uh, like computers like with Alpha Zero or so on, they will play almost perfect chess, so there will be no sense in playing correspondence chess, I think. Yeah, I mean, you you would know better than me, but that's sort of been my distant perspective, just in light of, I mean, I definitely, historically, I could see, I see the beauty in it, and I was a teenager pre-computer, or pre-computers that were good, at least. I, pl- I played a few correspondence games, and, you know, it was it was fun, and as you say, this idea of just spending hours or days thinking about a position could be great, but now now that there's there's no avoiding getting the the truth um, by yeah. just and, turn- and correspondence chess has such a nice history. Also, when I went uh, back from Moscow, just a small story, Dvoretsky gave me as a gift a book by Gregory uh, Sanakoev, I think is his name, is world champion in the third attempt is this guy who became world champion in correspondence chess in his third world championship. And uh, great book, great analysis, and you see the passion that uh, he had analyzing uh, these games at those times. Also, my, my, my father, when he was learning chess, there was this Dutch priest who lived here in my town, and he had this... Uh, he always made some. He was teaching chess to a, uh, a number of of young uh, boys, and then uh, he was he was analyzing with them his correspondence games. And so, look at this. The guy sent this game. Let's analyze, and so on. So there is a, such a nice history. But okay, uh, the world evolves. I yeah. think it's it's over. Yeah, or or, or ending if nothing else. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so just one more topic for you, Raphael. Um, if, if you're up for it, I'd like to talk a bit of chess improvement. Uh, but I thought maybe you could begin by telling us a little bit about what your academy does. Uh, well, I have this online chess academy. You can visit in... Uh, uh, Raf- I, I, I spell it in English, rafaelleital.com. So I have this website. And uh, there is an English version of this website also. And but not all of my articles are translated to English. Uh, I, I have several articles in Portuguese. Really, it's the biggest chess website in, in Portuguese for training purpose and news and so on. So uh, actually, this website grew a lot. I have already a, 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 a nice team working with me oh, in this great. project. Yeah, it really it's it's really big right now. And then it evolved, uh, it started in uh, 2013, and then my chess academy evolved. Uh, now I have this program of teaching uh, chess, and I give uh, lessons every week. And also there is uh, an international master, almost grandmaster, uh, because he has two GM norms, Renato Quintiliano, a strong player who, who, who teaches also in my academy. So we have this group of students, who gather together in a webinar uh, three times a week, and they also uh, are granted access to 
the whole uh, history of videos I have already recorded. So this sums up to more than uh, at the, at this time at more than 800 hours of wow. videos of every chess topic you can imagine. And in my chess academy, I teach uh, all this philosophy that I have learned about chess training. And it's in depth to Bobby Fischer's book, to Kotov's book, to Dvoretsky, and everything that I have learned. Uh, study of classics, uh, calculation training, study of endgames, and so on. So I try to, to be very honest to my students so what I think they should do to get to a stronger level. And uh, so this is a nice project. And also I have a course. Uh, a closed course, about 15, 15 to 20 hours, showing my complete method where I teach uh, uh, exactly what I think the, someone should be studying uh, from openings to end games. Okay, uh, this is available for now only in Portuguese, but maybe someday I think it will also be recorded in English. So anyway, I invite uh, the listeners to to take a look at the website, there are some nice articles, and you can have you can have fun criticizing my top ten list. For instance, <laughs> right. as I'm able at this. Yeah, it sounds like it's a good SEO strategy, if nothing else, <laughs> to, to have made that list. But uh, first of all, I just want to mention that your English is amazing, so I, I commend you on that. Um, oh, thanks. Where'd you? How'd you pick it up? Uh, no, it's just more like traveling and. My my father, I mean, my father has appeared a lot in this interview, as I see. But <laughs> he was, uh, yeah, he was uh, fluent. He is actually a fluent English speaker. He he went to the United States for one year when he was young, and he was an English teacher. And so, uh, well, he more or less uh, uh, motivated me to learn also. But most from my traveling and okay, it's uh, oh, to the, nowadays it's not very hard to learn English because English is uh, everywhere. By the way, um, maybe another uh, article that the listeners might like, might be a little controversial also, is a, I, I have wrote uh, an article about the books, yes. my favorite chess books, and also I have two articles actually, that uh, what I think are the 10 best chess books ever written, and the 20 books that I read to become a grandmaster. Ob obviously, this is a uh, simplification, but uh, the 20 books that I think are were most influential to to me to become a uh, grandmaster. Yeah, the, our, our, the listeners, I think, would definitely enjoy that. And without spoiling them all, I, I read at least the... I read your top 10 list. I'm not sure if I saw the... Uh, the 20 books that helped you become a grandmaster, but do you mind uh, sharing a few favorites just off the top of your head uh, with uh, our listeners? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to remember them all, but anyway, this is... Oh, and, uh, it's they don't, an always they don't have to agree exactly with the list as long yeah, as they're books that you like. Yeah, it's an always changing. So, uh, of course, my 60 memorable games from Bobby Fischer. I like a lot Think Like a Grandmaster by Kotov. Uh, all Dvoretsky's books, I like them very much, but especially his book on tactical play. I think it's the best he has written. Uh, there is a little-known book that I would highly recommend, because for some time I think John Nunn was probably the best chess author. Uh, I read his books with great pleasure, and there is one book he wrote called Secrets of Grandmaster Play. I'm not sure if this is still available. It's a fantastic chess book, and this might not be very well known. Uh, let's see. Well, Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual. It's, it's a book you should have in your uh, library. I, I, by the way, I'm a I, I'm huge fan of chess books. I have more than 1,000 chess books in my library. So this like end game manual for Dvoretsky, you you must have it. <laughs> you right. you don't have to read it from <laughs> right. cover to yeah. cover, but you must have it. Yeah, that, know, that's been a, that's been a theme with guests who have brought it up. Is uh, yeah, it's uh, and, uh, and I would say uh, maybe from uh, the most recent books and from most uh, listeners, this book from uh, Lessons with a Grandmaster from Boris Gulku and. Uh, 
I forgot the name of the co-author. It's a fantastic chess book, wonderful chess book. I think it's one of the best. Also, all, also I liked very much Boris Gelfand's book. I read the first volume. I didn't read uh, the second one, but the first I liked it very much. And okay, these are yeah. And probably... you said that the Goko book you mentioned in the blog is I hadn't heard of it somehow. And but the format is that it's basically a twenty one hundred player and Goko kind of him kind of walking the the twenty one hundred player through his thought process. Yeah, it's a book. Yeah, but not be fooled by this uh, thinking like maybe this is just for twenty one hundred players or something like that. This is a good book for players of all levels for. I read this book cover to cover, and I found uh, many exercises very useful to me. And actually, uh, what I understood by reading this book was something that it was not, well, it was clear, but not so clear as when I finished the book, that Goku knows so much more chess than I do. So <laughs> that was the, the main message, but I didn't imagine it was so much. Wow. So this is a book you have to read it. It's very good, very okay. good book. Excellent. It, and, it, sorry, it was also praised by Dvoretsky before his death. He also had, uh, and I, I, already, I was already a huge fan of this book. And I, if I'm not mistaken, Dvoretsky also praised it. Wow. High recommendation. Okay, definitely. I'll, yeah. I'll check that out and recommend listeners do the same. Um, last question for you, Rafael, if you don't mind. So in all of your teaching and your work with your students, is there... Is there one mantra or lesson that you find yourself repeating a lot? Is there some mistake that you just see over and over again? Just looking for some actionable advice that you could give for um, all of our uh, weekend warriors and young up-and-comers that might be listening to you. Uh, well, the advice is that I'm forced to give mo the most to my students. Uh, first of all is don't be so crazy about openings. Mm -hmm. So I think the 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 better player you become, the more important the opening become. But even for a, a grandmaster of twenty five hundred, I mean, you can live without such a great depth of uh, understanding of the openings if you are strong in other fields. So especially for uh, amateurs, I think they they spend too much time on openings. And also, what I say to my students is. Uh, study the classics. I repeat this to them every time. So I think they, um, uh, most players don't give due attention to the classics. And I think in many cases you can learn more from a game like, uh, I don't know, Capablanca Yates or Capablanca Janowski or something like that than from Carlsen Caruana, which uh, is in a uh, level of complexity that might not be so interesting for some players. So you can probably sometimes learn more uh, uh, analyzing this classical game. So I think this is very important. And also, of course, you have to train tactics right. nearly every day. So yeah. this is like, uh, it's like going to the gym or making like physical exercise. You have to do it every day. Yeah, because so. what I was thinking when you were talking, comparing uh, the Capablanca classics to the the modern, even the modern masterpieces, but just a modern GM game, I, I think that it's not so much that people think that the modern games are more instructive, it's that people wonder if they should be studying games at all when you can be like doing all these study hacks with uh, with tactics trainers and uh, solving studies and stuff like that. But you think that studying the classics is still important. Oh, very important. You reach a limitation in your knowledge. And I, I can say that one of my strengths as a chess player is that I get, have a good grasp of the classics, especially in Brazil. My opponents uh, not, were not so strong in this field, so I could more or less uh, understand some positions better than them. So I think this was really important. And I have, I have seen some... Uh, uh, trainers and also some books that uh, don't recommend you to study classics. I think there is even one book that say something in the terms of I don't think it's important to study Fisher's games uh, or something like that. This is like stabbing me in the heart. So <laughs> I always say study the classics, please. This is my advice. 
Okay, yeah. And the fact that there's people say, advising both things, of course, shows that there's more than one way to become a great player. But, but I mean, certainly, I mean, your, your knowledge of chess history is evident. Um, and I mean, I, I don't dispute at all that studying people like Fisher has helped your chess, but it also just makes you a more well-rounded uh, chess professional. Um, yeah, exactly. This is very helpful. Of course, as you said, uh, I'm sure that there are players who can get to a stronger level just training a lot of tactics and studying the, the computer in the right way. I don't. Uh, tr- I'm not trying to say that this is uh, the absolute best method or something, but that's the way I recommend. Also, I think it's important for you, uh, for a chess player, to understand the legacy of the great players, to know this history. This is all important, I think. Yeah, you got to have your talking points down for who the greatest player is when when the debates come up. Yeah, this is also <laughs> important. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, on that note, Raphael, this has been fantastic. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun um, hearing your stories and, and getting your perspective. Uh, thanks a lot, Ben. And I hope the listeners also like it. Yeah, I'm sure they will. And so I'll, I'll link to your academy. Is there any other way for people to keep up with you or should they just uh, just hit up that website? Well, anyone that is keen to communicate with me, you are welcome to send me a message in my email and uh, you can find it in my website. And also, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm the social media and all this, but uh, I think the most easy way is to find me in my website. You have all, all, all my contact over there. Okay. Okay. So I'll put links to all that stuff for people to track it down. And, and thanks again. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank everyone who helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess. The ways to do so include writing a positive review on Apple Podcasts or another podcast platform, telling a friend, spreading the word on social media. All of that stuff helps. But most of all, I want to thank the people who support the show financially. Without you guys, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. So I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities, my PayPal and Patreon Perpetual Chess Partners. Here we go. They are extra special thanks to Chessable.com and Quality Chess Books and the Capital City Chess Club, Apprentice Chess Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Kathy Cow, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider. Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natel, Greg Shahadi, Guvin Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Cromarty, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, Lorraine Duray, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Can, my main man, Moonmaster 9000, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan, Todd Kennedy, and I'd also like to thank Aaron Wafflar, Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Tarakov, Andrew Perry, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalicki, aka Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, David Kofer, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Lucas of U.S. Chess, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley, CEO of Chessable.com, Daylin Shelton, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, Donnie Ariel, who may be an IM elect or maybe just has the titles, and I'm not sure if that makes him an IM elect, but thank you, Donnie, anyway. Fox Valley Chess Club, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vanderveld, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, James Banastia, Jason Onfang, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, JJ Stranad, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Zlosnik, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Reiforth, Laura Beljavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspide, 
Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Posse Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Swanee, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahalva, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, William H. Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. I will catch you all next week.